Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, Jennifer Aker, um, uh, kind of a beloved now professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, uh, I'm so pleased that she's going to be here to talk about the power of purpose. Uh, and I'm not even going to try to tell you exactly what she's going to talk about. I'm going to let her do it for us. Please welcome Jennifer Aker. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the purpose of purpose. Um, before I do that, I know it's a little wonky, um, but if you could just think to yourself, extra credit points if you can write it down, what is one thing that brings you happiness right now? And then, a second later, think about what's one thing that's truly meaningful for you. Uh, anyone have that down? Oh, in the back. Yes, in the back. What's one thing that brings you happiness in the back? Love. And then what's one thing that brings you purpose? Global citizenship. That's not exactly what we discussed, but it's very, very good. Uh, there's a, definitely an attempt to try and get more interaction in these dark rooms. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about our behavioral research that's going on at uh, Stanford. When you do ask that question of what is happiness or how stable is it for you, um, you find that most individuals find that happiness uh, should be for them pretty stable. It's one thing. It's probably going to be that thing for a long time. Um, and it's that end point to chase, sort of guides you, um, a goal. But it's not. We have uh, a lot of research to show that the meaning of happiness shifts in very systematic ways over the life course and even throughout the day. So the way to read this slide is um, sort of thinking about a demographic perspective. Uh, it's based on the We Feel Fine data set collected by Sepp Kamvar and Jonathan Harris. And what they do is they write an algorithm that combs the blogosphere for all mentions of I feel and I am feeling. And so um, 12 million data points are on this slide, uh, cross-cultural data set. And what they find is what people are feeling and how you correlate that with other nouns, adjectives, verbs, uh, gives us great insight into what actually drives or correlates with our happiness over time. So this is the way you read it. We start out simple. These are 11 to 14-year-olds. Does any, anyone have an 11 to 14-year-old? OK, good. When you say, how are you feeling, they say? What you do today? That's right. OK, so there's not this big emotional lexicon associated with them. Uh, but we soon fill up with angst. So there's a lot of angstiness with 18-year-olds, 15 to 18-year-olds. When they do feel happy, it's synonymous with excitement, a very angsty form of happiness. And then feelings of confinement. So 19 to 22, people feel confined or not well understood. They, they might not even understand themselves. Until we leave those feelings behind to go to conquer the world, at 23 to 26, they start to think about power and money and status and the opportunity to get those things. You hear this work that suggests that happiness does not equate to money, power, and status. Untrue around here. The, the belief that it does um, exists. Before gradually trading ambition for balance, so around 30, people start to blog about feeling unbalanced, um, developing an appreciation for their physical bodies, because at 35, they've gone downhill uh, significantly without you know, anyone knowing. So they feel fat or overweight or out of shape oftentimes. When they do feel happy, it's when they do feel balanced and physically strong. And our children at 35, uh, an evolving sense of connectedness for which we feel grateful calm, happy, and blessed. Um, blessed correlates with contentment. So if you ask an individual, um, are you happy? And they say yes at age 50, uh, what they mean is they feel content, they feel grateful, they feel blessed. And if you ask an individual who's uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, do you feel happy? They say yes, and what they mean is they feel excited. So the meaning of happiness shifts in very systematic ways every five or 10 years through the life course. And it's not just linear. We have experiments that show we can make 18-year-olds act like 60-year-olds and 60-year-olds act like 18-year-olds. But what's important about this slide is that it shows that we often pursue happiness, um, yet once we attain it, its meaning changes. And so then we start the pursuit again how might we rethink our approach to happiness? And now this is hard because what we're promised in the world is a lot of happiness. Um, you should honk if you're happy. 
Uh, you can go shop for happiness. So if you buy more things, you can open some happiness. You can have it delivered. You can also put it on your body, and you can find it in your closet. Um, and this is hard to remedy because our culture, for a very long time, has promised happiness associated with things that potentially don't in the long run actually drive happiness. So how might we rethink our approach to happiness? And more specifically, how might we create products, build organizations, and live lives that cultivate happiness if aiming for it is not, in fact, the key? So we have a, a new body of research to show that when you aim for a purpose, something that's deeply meaningful for you, you actually become happier. And so when Tina um, argues that what might actually be advi um, advisable is to think about big, lofty goals and figure out how to reverse engineer the micro steps to actually achieve them and bring other people along for the ride and put a timeline on it, there's something to that. Now, um, a large-scale st uh, study recently found that 80% of CEOs who were surveyed actually believe um, that uh, declared that purpose is important for organizations, but the large majority of them don't know how to harness it. Some individuals find purpose to be really important at the individual level. Others are associating purpose with uh, philanthropy or just simply CSR, siloed to a certain area of the business. But the reality is that developing purpose is much more of a skill than we think, both at the individual level as well as the organizational level. And this matters because purpose at work is associated with really positive um, uh, measures, uh, such as um, productivity, such as job satisfaction, retention. In one study, researchers asked people within companies, to what degree do you find meaning or purpose at work? And what they found was those individuals who said yes were three times more likely uh, to stay with their companies, they're 1.7 times more likely to say that they like their job, and they're 1.4 times more likely to be really engaged and productive at work. So this means something very significant from the bottom line. Now, the problem here is that most managers believe that purpose feels very big, but it can be as small as feeling like you're making a difference in the life of one other individual. Purpose feels oftentimes static and defined by the company or the CEO or oftentimes their spouse. Um, but it can be defined by employees if you give them the right tools. Uh, lastly, purpose often feels like a goal or a destination. And yet research shows that by far and away this is not true. It's much more likely to be a process that as you feel like you're working toward it, purpose and meaning is actually cultivated. Um, I like this quote a lot. It's uh, two social psychologists who wrote, pursuing purpose is a dynamic process. The sense of one's life is meaningful and purposeful is an ongoing day-by-day -day, um, journey, constantly unfolding phenomenon, and it's not an end state to be resolved. Um, so if you look at the people that you're working with, or even your family members, even your 11-year-old, and you start to uh, measure to what degree are you using unique strengths, uh, to what degree are you passionate about what you do, and to what degree are you doing something that you believe the world needs and will pay you for, it's in the intersection of those things in a day-to-day -day world um, that purpose comes to be. Um, this means a lot because the purpose of purpose is that it provides clarity. Right now we're in a world where uh, there's significant confusion. Uh, a lot of the systems that we have uh, hold near and dear for a long time um, are being dismantled or could be dismantled. Um, and so the question becomes, what provides clarity in these times where life is confusing? Uh, those individuals that feel connected to purpose and then have a team of individuals who often feel the same purpose, those are individuals who can work nimbly and effectively. Um, I often talk to companies and, and ask individuals, to what degree do you believe you're playing on the same team together? And those companies where people feel like they're on the same team, and it sounds trite, but it's incredibly powerful, those are the individuals that feel connected to purpose. Um, you also find increased levels of productivity, uh, increased levels of health, actual physical health. Uh, and lastly, um, many argue greater profits because you've got the increased 
uh, productivity and the engagement and the retention. And as a result, you get uh, accrue more profits. And this isn't a new idea. Companies like Whole Foods have been talking about this for a long time. Um, but what's really interesting is that individual, I, I work in a business school, I was taught to run cases with my students and say, what's the ult ultimate goal of what you're doing with your organization? And they should say, maximizing profitability. That is, in fact, the right answer. Um, but what would it look like if we trained our students to say, maximizing purpose is our answer? I once gave a talk at Adobe, and uh, the CEO was in the room with his senior management, and I asked, what is your purpose? What is your single focus goal? My husband in the back and I wrote a book called The Dragonfly Effect, and uh, it was uh, in keeping with that model, and he said it's to hit five billion in five years. And you could see the whole team look deflated, and he noticed too. And so he shifted and he said to unlock creativity in the world. And all of a sudden, the CSR person, the marketing person, the finance person, all of a sudden, they, they stood a little straighter. What's really exciting is that companies are already resonating with this. If you look at Empowerment and Lululemon, and you look at Google and Truth, or you look at Beauty and Apple, or if you look at the new campaign by Airbnb focused on love and connection, if you look at Kara's uh, company and, and the value of health that she shared in her personal story, if you look at Bill Gates and this idea with Melinda of creating real impact, and if you look at what Stuff has done with Nothing But Nuts or all of his partners, it's about this purpose of believing, of really believing you could be anything. You could transform yourself. You can do anything you want. So. Uh, what are the goals and metrics that are used by these companies that are maximizing profitability? Um, they're looking to maximize impact, not just profit. They're measuring how we use our time, not just how we're using our money. They're listening to and sharing stories, not just data. They're focusing on transformation, not just the achievement of goals. And they're creating a feeling of abundance, um, not that scarcity. They feel like they're on the same team. Um, I like this graph, it was from a blog, but it looks at the language that people actually use when they're in a traditional company, really anchored on maximizing profitability and they have to act in urgent ways versus a company that is maximizing profitability. So how do you cultivate purpose? Um, Three things. One is to design for moments. We have a lot of research to show that those defining moments matter more than we think. Uh, designed for stories. People want to be valued members of a winning team on an inspired mission. They want to feel like they're part of a story. Uh, designed for chapters. We're more adaptable than we think. And if you think about this graph and the shifts we make in each of these chapters, it'll make you understand how we might rethink our approach to happiness. So in sum, we think that we can attain happiness and often ask ourselves, how can we be happier? But we don't really know what makes us happy, even though we think we do. Could we rethink our approach to happiness if happiness is not the goal? How do you anchor on meaning and purpose? And those individuals who do will become happier, and the organizations who do will have a very different metric of success. They do it by anchoring on an inspired mission or unlocking that purpose in individuals where work and life blend fluidly together and you're on a journey, one that's meaningful, anchored on moments, captured in stories, shifting in chapters, and guided by purpose. Thank you very much.